Okay, not sure what happened there. Anyway, um, yeah, so we're going to repeat our CG and just check the uh, question here. Determine the possible starting and finishing points of Nessir's route is minimised to give reasons for your answer. So um, start and finish at DH and uh, the reasons are over here. Uh, find the length of Nasir's new route. Um, so the length of it, well, that's going to be the original network minus the three arcs that were connected to B. So that's minus 15, minus 42, minus 38, because those are not being traversed at all. And then I'm repeating CG, so I need to add seven to that. Um, so that's going to give me the total length. So 370 minus 15 minus 42 minus 38 plus 7 is 282. Okay, that's meters. Um, so CG is the shortest pairing. Um, if you want a reason for either. Okay. All right. Question number three. Uh -huh. This looks like a four inch question. Right, so here's the question. Direct roads between five villages, A, B, C, D, and E, are shown in figure two. The weight on each arc is the time in minutes it takes to travel along the corresponding road. And the road from D to C is a one way, as indicated by the arrow on the corresponding arc. Floyd's algorithm is to use to find the complete network of shortest times between the five villages. Set up the initial time and route matrices. Okay, that we should be able to see them both. There we go. All right. So initial time matrix. Well, this is just the arcs. Um, so uh, always dashes down the diagonal because you don't have um, any loops. Um, a connects to B with an eight. Uh, a connects to C with a four. A connects to D with a 7, and A does not connect to an E, so we're going to put an infinite sign there. Okay, B connects to A with an 8, B connects to C with a 3, B connects to D, it doesn't, so it's an infinite, and B connects to E with a 10. Uh, C connects to A with a 4, C connects to B with a 3, C connects to D with an infinite, okay, so this is going from C to D, so therefore... It's infinite because you can't go from C to D. And C connects to E with a 6. D connects to A with a 7. Connects to B with an infinite. Connects to C with a 1. And connects to E with a 1. And then E connects to A with an infinite. Connects to B with a 10. C with a 6. And D with a 1. Okay, so that's the initial time matrix. So you get one mark for filling all of that out. Um, if you make one mistake, you lose your mark. Um, bit of a shame. Uh, the initial root matrix, we just start with the column headers all the way down. So A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 D, 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 E, 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 E. Okay, one mark. <clears throat> the matrices after two iterations of Floyd's are shown below. Okay, so we're now two iterations in from our original. So if you got this wrong, it's not going to affect any further answers, which is good. Uh, perform the next two iterations of Floyd's algorithm that follow from these tables above. You should show the time and root matrices after each iteration. Okay. Um, so if I fold that back, I think we can get this on. Okay. Um, so, this is the iteration we're currently at, iteration number two, and we're going to do the third iteration, and then we'll do the fourth iteration. So, the third iteration means we are locking in C. So, all the numbers in the C are going to remain as they are. You, see, you can only use a black pen in the exam, so um, don't, don't, don't use any colours around here. Um, on the, the non-lead diagonal, it'll be dashes all the way down. Okay. Um... Right, now we decide if the sum of those is less than the current entry. So, for example, here, 3 plus 4 is 7. The current entry is 8. Uh, 7 is less than 8, so it gets replaced. So I'll pop a 7 in there. And because it's replaced, I'm just going to pop a square bracket around it. It just illustrates to me that I've changed it, uh, which makes it easier to reference it later. 
Okay, 4 plus 11 is 15, so that stays as a 7. 4 plus 6 is 10, uh, that replaces the 18, because that's smaller. Uh, 3 plus 4 is 7, that replaces the 8. Uh, 14 replaces the 15. And 3 plus 6 is 9, which replaces the 10. Uh, 4 plus 1 is 5, that replaces the 7. 3 plus 1 is 4, that replaces the 15. Lots of changes here. 1 plus 6 is 7, no, the 1 remains. Uh, 4 plus 6 is 10, that replaces the 18. Uh, 3 plus 6 is 9, that replaces the 10. And finally, 6 plus 11 is 17, which 1 is definitely smaller. Okay, so that is the time matrix, and now the root matrix. Anything that's got square brackets around it gets changed to a C in the root matrix. So we're going to have a C there, a C there, C, 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 C. Uh, yep, yeah, that's good. And then everything else remains as it was up here. So um, I'm going to have an A there, an A there. BB, uh, that's all C's, uh, that's a D, A, D, D, and E, E, E. Okay, that's one iteration, so that's the third iteration, and you get four marks for completing that one. And then um, do it again. This time, we're going to lock D in place, so we get 7, 14, 11, dash, 1, Five four one dash one dashes down into the lead diagonal. Um, seven plus one is eight, so that replaces the ten. Uh, seven plus one is eight, that remains as a four, that remains as a seven. Uh, everything on that row is smaller than fourteen, so that remains as it was. Um, eleven plus one, yeah, again, it's eleven, so eleven's going to remain as it was. Um, 1 plus 5 is 6, that replaces the 10. 1 plus 4 is 5, that replaces the 9. 1 plus 1 is 2, that replaces the 6. Uh, and that's it. Okay, so those with square brackets are the ones that I've replaced. So that gets a D, a D, a D, and a D. And then everything else remains as it was from the previous root matrix. So we're going to get A, C, A, C, C, B, B, C, 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 C. D, C, A, D, D, and C, E, E, E. There we go. The final time matrix after completion of Floyd's algorithm is shown. So this is now the um, time matrix after the fifth iteration. Use the nearest neighbor algorithm starting at A to find a Hamiltonian cycle in the complete network of shortest times. Find the time taken for the cycle and interpret the cycle in terms of actual villages visited. Okay, so here's our uh, time matrix and we want to calculate the nearest neighbour starting at A. Nearest neighbour starting at A. So from this matrix here. So part C, part I, we start at A. We're going to go to C, that's the nearest neighbour. And then from C... We're going to go to D, that's the nearest neighbour. Uh, from D, uh, we're going to go to E, that's the nearest neighbour. And from E, we would go to D, but we've already been there, so no good. Uh, C, no, we've already been there. A, no, we have to go to B, so that's a B. And then we've now been to all the nodes, so we go back to A. And the shortest from B to A is 7. Uh, so that's the nearest neighbour root. Uh, the length of that, which I think was the answer to part two. Let's just check that. Uh, find the time taken off the cycle. Yep, do the times in here. Um, 4, 5, 6, 15, 22. And that was in minutes. And then part three, interpret this in terms of the original network. Well, if I go back here... A to C is 4, that is a direct link. Uh, C to D was 1. Hold on, C to D isn't 1. Uh, 
No, no, I've done it all wrong. Mm. Okay, let's do that bit again then. Apologies, that's not right. Uh, C, put A. Right, start at A. We're going to go to C, which is a 4. From C, there we're going across. Yeah, it's not a symmetrical matrix, is it? Right, C, we need to go to B, which is 3. Uh, from B, we go to E, which is 9. Um, I'm putting that down here. Um, okay. uh, from E, let's go to D, which is 1. And then from D, we want to go back to A, which is 5. So that's 7, 16, 17, 22. Oh, it's still 22. Um, and then part three, uh, interpret that in terms of the original network. So there's my original network. Um, so to get from A to C is just a direct link from A to C. Um, and then I want to go to B, which is again a direct route. Um, from B I want to go to E, which is 10 to get there, so it's not direct, it's actually via C. So I'm going to go from B to C to E. Uh, e to D is 1, that is a direct link. And then D to A is actually via C. So we go from D to A, and we go from D to C to A, uh, distance of 5. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the route in the original matrix, that's the time, uh, and that was the nearest neighbour applied to the network of shortest distances, or shortest times. Okay, question 4. Figure 3 shows the constraints of a linear programming problem in X and Y, where R is the feasible region. Write down the inequalities that define R. Okay, so I've got a copy of it here. So, this one here, you see the side of it is less than or greater than. The other two are fine because I can just check the origin. Um, but this one, this line goes through the origin. So just be a little bit careful. I want 2Y to be less than 5X. Um, so part A, uh, 2Y is going to be less than or equal to 5X, because I want the Y value to be smaller than the X value, 5X value. Um, this one here, I don't want the origin, so therefore 0, 0 does not satisfy it. So Y is going to be greater than or equal to X plus 1. And this one here, I do want the origin to satisfy it, because the origin does satisfy that constraint. Uh, therefore... Um, I want 6x plus 5y to be less than or equal to 30, so that the origin satisfies the constraint. Okay. Uh, so those are the three constraints. Okay, question. The objective is to maximise p, where p is 3x plus y. Obtain the exact value of p at each of the three vertices of r, and hence find the optimal vertex v. Okay, so we're using the vertex testing method. Uh, the question, the exam can ask for either. You must follow through with, with um, what it's asking for. Okay, so I'm going to be a bit lazy and use the equation solver. Just because I'm pretty sure these are going to be horrible equations. Nice fractional numbers coming out. Um, okay, I've got the equations here. So, 5x minus 2y. Uh, 5x minus 2y is 0. And let's go with this one here. So I get x minus y is equal to minus 1. And that gives me that x is 2 thirds. Does that look right to the graph? Yeah. Just make sure I'm right to the graph. Um, so x is 2 thirds. And I get that the y coordinate is 5 thirds. Okay. So that's this one here. Um, so maybe call that a. Um, B, okay, so I've got A down here. B is the intersect of 2y and 5x. So that top line stays the same, but the bottom line is now 6x plus 5y is 30. And that gives me that x is 7, 60 30 sevenths. And because the question is asked for exact values, you've got to keep these exact. And the y value is 150 30 sevenths. 
And then finally, the C coordinate, that's the intersect of the other two lines. Um, so 6x plus 5y is 30, we've already got that one down. And then it's just this one, which is uh, x minus y equals minus 1. Uh, so I get x is 25 elevenths. And y is 36 elevenths. Okay. So those are the three points. Uh, so I want to calculate the value of P at each of these points. And P, as defined by the question, is equal to 3x plus y. So each of these, back into computation mode. 3x, so that's 2, plus y, that's 5 thirds, that's 11 thirds. And just to give it a bit of perspective, that's about 3.7. Okay, this one, 3x, so that's going to be 3 times 60 over 37, plus y, which is 150 over 37. So that's 330 37ths. And again, perspective, that's about 8.9, so much better than the first point. Kind of expect that. Look at the graph. And then finally, 3 times 25 11ths. Oops, that's a plus. Uh, plus 36 elevenths, which is 111 elevenths, and that comes to about 10.1. Okay, so that's clearly the biggest. Um, so therefore, x equals 25 elevenths, y equals 36 elevenths, and p, as an exact value, is 111 elevenths. Um, yeah, so you have to illustrate that you've tested all the vertices. Um, and then part C. The objective is changed to maximise Q, where Q equals 3x plus AY. Given that A is a constant and the optimal vertex is still V, find the range of possible values of A. Okay, so which is my optimal vertex? That was this one here, wasn't it? C. So I want that to be my optimal vertex. V, which means the gradient of this line cannot be less than the gradient of this, which is 1. And the gradient of that line can go up anywhere to infinity. Still cross V, so that's fine. Um, coming in the negative direction, it can be a really big negative number, but there's a certain negative number where it then it'll clip over to B. Um, so I want it to be more negative than the gradient of this line, and I want it to be more positive than the gradient of this line. So, part C, um, the gradient of 3x plus ay equals q, I don't care about Q, actually. It's just the gradient of that line that I care about, uh, which is minus 3 over A. Okay. So that's the gradient of the line. And I want that to be bigger than 1. Okay, so minus 3 over A is greater than 1. Um, that implies that A is less than, th uh, that's be bigger than one, positive. Um, I want it to be V. Let me just reread the question. The objective is changed to maximise Q. Given that A is a constant, the optimal vertex is still V, which is this one. Ah, uh, 
okay, that would be because A is negative. Um, yes, okay. Right, so yeah, if, if, the, if the equation is positive, then the, 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 the value of A would be negative. Um, okay, so because the value of A is negative, that means that minus 3 is less than A, i.e. A is greater than minus 3. Okay, and that would give you any positive gradient um, that would go up to the vertical. So that would go from this line up to the vertical. So I keep V as um, as the optimal. And then looking at the negative direction, we want this part to be true. So we're going to want minus 3 over A to be more negative than the gradient of this line, which is minus six fifths and um, because we've got a negative gradient here that means a is now positive um, seven times by a so that's fine so I get minus 15 is less than minus 6 a uh, divide both sides by minus 2 uh, sorry minus 6 I'll get 2.5 is now greater than a Okay, so therefore I want A to be between minus 3, because I want A to be bigger than minus 3, but I also want A to be less than 2.5. So I get minus 3 is less than A is less than 2.5. And that's my answer to C. Okay. And that's me considering uh, the gradient of the lines that go through V, uh, that keep the vertex V on that, on that line. Okay. Question five. Uh, the nine distinct numbers in the following list are to be packed into bins of size 50. 23, 17, 19, X, 24, 8, 18, 10, 21. When the first fit bin packing algorithm is applied to the numbers in the list, it results in the following allocation. Explain why X must lie between... 20, uh, 13 and 21. Okay. There. So, part A. It must be greater than 13. Okay, what's going to happen? So, 23 gets put in, then a 17 gets put in, then a 19 gets put there. Um, Okay, so we know that x must be less than or equal to 21, otherwise uh, bin 2 contains more than 50, which obviously isn't allowed because the, the bins are size 50. Um, we're also told that they're distinct. So we know actually that x doesn't equal 21 because we've got 21 already. Um, so x is less than 21 because x doesn't equal 21 because they're distinct, which means they're all different. Um, bigger than 13, um, it must be bigger than 13, otherwise I assume the 24 could have been put in there. Uh, what is 19 plus 13 plus 24? 56, uh, no, maybe it's the 18, ah oh, yes, the 18 is before the 10 as well, um, 18, yes, that's 50, okay, uh, so x is greater than 13, otherwise uh, the 18 um, would have been put in bin 2. Before the 10. Okay, there we go. So, therefore, uh, we know that x is bigger than 13 and x is less than 21, as stated. Okay, great. Uh, part B. The same list of numbers is sorted into descending order. A bubble sort, starting at the left-hand end of the list, is to be used to obtain the sorted list. After the first complete pass, the list is this. Using this information, write down the smallest interval that must contain x, giving reasons for your inequality. Okay, 
So after the first pass, so the first pass is in descending order. So it compares these two and says, okay, yes, let's swap them. So that's now 17 and 23. It then looks at these two and says, should we swap them? Yes. So 19 gets put there and 23 gets put there. Should we swap them? Yes. So then X gets put, oh, hold on, into descending order. Come on, pay attention. Right, do these swap? No. Do these swap? Yes, because you want the biggest to the left. Do these swap? Well, yes, they have, because this, uh, no, they haven't, sorry, because the 17 is still there, which means that X must be smaller than 17, otherwise it would have swapped with it. Yes. X must be smaller than 17. And then it's compared these two and said, okay, no, the 24 and the X must swap. Um, and then the 24, the X and the 8 don't swap, but we already know that X is bigger than 8, so that's fine. So that means X is less than 17. So 13 is less than X is less than 17. It doesn't equal 17 because they are distinct. So we can't have another 17. Okay, good. Um, when the first fit decreasing bin packing algorithm is applied to the nine distinct numbers, it results in the following allocation. 24, 23, 21, 19, 10, 18, 17, x, 8. Given that only one of the bins is full and that x is an integer, calculate the value of x. You must give reasons for your answer. Okay, so that is a 47. That is a 50. That is an 8. Given that only one of the bins is full, which means this one is not 50 because we have a full bin already. So 18 plus 17 must be strictly less than 50, not so plus x. So part C, 18 plus 17 plus x must be strictly less than 50. Okay, we've already got a full bin. Let's put it here in my answers because bin two is full. Uh, so this says then that x is strictly less then 50 minus 18 minus 17. Uh, X is strictly less than 15. Therefore, 13 is less than X is less than 15. We're also told that X is an integer, and there's only, only one integer that satisfies that, uh, which is X is 14. So therefore, X is 14, and that justifies uh, all I need to. Okay, put on to my question. State with justification whether the graph in figure four is Eulerian, semi-Eulerian, or neither. Okay, so it's all about the order of the arcs. So we've got an odd order there. Uh, one, two, three, four, six, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, odd order there. Everything else is even, so therefore it is semi-Eulerian. And that's because exactly two nodes have an odd order. Okay. Um, the weights on the arcs in figure four represent distances. The weight on arc EF is X, where X lies somewhere between 12 and 26. And the weight on arc DG is Y, where Y lies somewhere between zero and 10. An inspection route of minimum length that traverses each arc at least once is found. The inspection route starts and finishes at A and has a length of 409. It is also given that the length of the shortest route from F to G via A is 140. Use appropriate algorithms, find the value of X and the value of Y. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit so we know that this length is x now yeah, that's given that's fine that's y okay we know that the shortest route from f to g via a is 140 and we also know we need to find the shortest route from a to g because those are the two odd order nodes so i'm going to start at a in my in my bike here so that is the first order 
of labelling, and that gets a zero. Uh, 24, 42, and 65. Uh, so that gets a two with a 24. Update 39, that is smaller. Um, okay, the smallest out of those two is this one, so that's a three with a 39. 39 plus 21 is 60, which is smaller than 65. 39 plus 19 is 58. 84 and 70. Okay. And now choose the smallest, so that's this one up here, so that's a four, which is 58. Uh, 58 plus x, but we're told something about x. We're told x is less than 26, uh, so therefore that's definitely smaller than 84. So 58 plus x is definitely less than 84. Um, we're also told x is bigger than 12, which means that 60 is, is smaller than 58 plus x. So if this one gets chosen next, which is a 5. Uh, 60 plus y, um, but we're told y is less than 10, so that must be less than 70. And 60 plus 34 is 94. That's clearly bigger. And then at these two... Um, which is shorter, um, that is at most 70, that is, well, we're told x is actually strictly bigger than 12 as well, so that must be more than 70, therefore this is shorter, uh, so that gets 6 with a 60 plus y, um, that would then be 84 plus y, which is clearly bigger than 58 plus x, so 58 plus x wins that one, so 7, okay. Great. So that's Dijkstra's algorithm done. Okay, we're told the shortest route from F to G via A is 140. So let's put that into an equation. F to G via A. Well, that's going to be equal the shortest route from A to F and the shortest route from A to G added together. So that's going to be... 118 plus x plus y. And we're told that equals 140. Okay, so that's one piece of information. Um, we're also told that the inspection route in the network has a length of 409, uh, which means we need the shorter route from A to G, which is 60 plus y, and then we need to add that to the length of the network which is 320 plus x plus y. So 320 plus x plus y plus the 60 plus y, that needs to equal uh, 409. So that's a pair of simultaneous equations now. So 140 minus 118, x plus y is 22. And x plus 2y, 409 uh, minus 320 minus 60 is 29. So I've added a y, I've added 7, therefore y is 7 and x must be 15. Okay, that's that. Um, and finally, question 7. A maximization linear programming problem in X, Y, and Z is to be solved using the two-stage simplex method. The partially completed initial tableau is shown below. Using the information in the above tableau, formulate the linear programming problem, state the objective, and list the constraints as inequalities. Okay, so this is a two-stage one. We can tell that because we've got the A values up here, and we have a capital A down here. These then are the constraints, and this is the objective. Um, it's a maximization problem, so we know it's going to be to maximize. So maximize, this is part A. Uh, it's going to be 2x plus y plus 3z. Okay, because you, you can read off those values there. Um, equals P. Um, subject to... 
And then we need, need to read off the constraints. So the first one is going to be x plus 2y plus 3z. This is a less than or equal to constraint. So x plus 2y plus 3z is less than or equal to because there's a slack variable and no artificials. 45. Uh, this one we're going to have 3x plus 2y. And this one's going to be greater than or equal to because we've got a negative 1 there, which means that's a surplus variable, and we have a 1 there, so it's an artificial variable, which means the origin is not part of that constraint. And similarly, this one here is the same issue, minus x plus 4z is going to be greater than or equal to 4, uh, for the same reason, greater than or equal to 4. Okay, so that, that's the program that this table represents. Okay. Um, part B. Complete the bottom row of table one in the answer book. You should make your method and working clear. Okay, so B. Um, capital A is going to be equal to minus A1 plus A2. And we're going to look to maximise A. Um, okay, so we know that 3x plus 2y minus s2 plus a1 equals 9. And we also know that minus x plus 4z minus s3 plus a2 equals 4. Um, so if we add those together, we'll get 2x plus 2y plus 4z minus s2 minus s3 plus a1 plus a2 um, equals 13. And then we submit a the subject of that. Um, so we want a negative there, so that's minus a. Um, so yeah, it's times of a minus one. So minus 2x, minus 2y, minus 4z, plus s2, plus s3, minus, or plus a, um, equals minus 13. Okay, and we just feed that line into the table. So that's minus 2x, minus 2y, minus 4z, uh, plus s2, plus s3, equals minus 13. Uh, that's if we're going to maximise A. Uh, part C. Explain, oh, the following tableau is obtained after two iterations of the first stage of the two-stage simplex method. Explain how the above tableau shows that a basic feasible solution has been found for the original linear programming problem. Um, simple, the, the artificial variable is zero. Uh, write down the basic feasible solution for the second stage. Okay. So for C, part I, uh, A equals zero. This implies that A1 equals A2 equals zero. Therefore, the solution is not artificial. Okay. And uh, part two, write down the basic feasible solution. Well, we've got x is three. Uh, y is non-basic, so that's zero. Uh, Z is seven quarters. Uh, S1 is a slack, is 147 fourths. Uh, the two surpluses are both zero. Uh, we already know the artificials are zero, so we can ignore those. And P is 45 quarters. And part D. Taking the most negative number in the profit row to indicate the pivot column, perform one complete iteration of the second stage of the two-stage simplex method to obtain a new tableau T. 
Make your method clear by stating the row operations you use. In fact, that's not the end of the question. There's more, there's more over there. Okay, so taking the most negative number in the profit row. So that means we are going to select this one. Minus 11 twelfths, that's the most negative. And then we're going to conduct a ratio test. Um, so that's 147 quarters divided by the contents, divided by 7 twelfths, uh, which is 63. Uh, that's going to be negative. That's going to be negative. Therefore, that is the one I choose. Uh, that then is my pivot. Um, just one iteration. Uh, we've got a spare copy underneath if we mess up. Okay, so I want to make that a one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to times row one by 12 sevenths, okay, to make that um, and the number one. So everything on that row is going to be times 12 sevenths. So 12 over seven times five sixths. Um, sorry, 12 over 7 times 5 sixths is 10 sevenths. So that's a 10 sevenths there. Um, that's a zero. In fact, all the basic variables I can fill out. So S2, X, and Z, um, that's a 1, 0, 0. That's a 0, 0, 1, 0. And that's a 0, 0, 0. Uh, 1 times 12 sevenths is obviously 12 sevenths. Uh, 3 quarters times 12 sevenths. is nine sevenths. Uh, the value is 63, we've already calculated that over there. Okay, um, this one, I want to get rid of the minus a third. So therefore I'm going to do row two plus a third times the pivot row. Okay, this is the pivot row here. So I'm gonna do row two plus a third times the pivot row. So. Uh, I'm going to have two thirds plus a third times the pivot row, which is ten sevenths. So eight sevenths. Uh, this one here, we're going to have um, yes, zero plus a third m multiplied by the pivot row, which is twelve sevenths. So it's four sevenths. Then we're going to have zero plus a third times nine sevenths, which is three sevenths. And then we're going to have three plus a third times 63, which is 24. Okay. And at row three, we need to get rid of a twelfth. So it's going to be row three plus a twelfth times the pivot row. So that's going to be a sixth, no, that one there, a sixth, plus a twelfth multiplied by the pivot row, which is ten sevenths. So that's two sevenths. Uh, twelve sevenths. Oh, sorry, no, not twelve sevenths. One plus a twelfth times twelve sevenths. It's going to be oops, eight sevenths. Okay, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, minus a quarter. Oh, because it's zero. Oh. Zero. So that's one seventh. Yeah. There we go. Uh, minus a quarter. Plus a twelfth. Times nine sevenths. 
So easy to make a mistake on these questions. Um, seven quarters plus a twelfth times 63. Seven. And then finally, row four uh, plus 11 twelfths times the pivot to get rid of that 11 twelfths there. So we're going to have five sixths plus 11 twelfths times 10 sevenths is 15 sevenths. At zero plus 11 twelfths times 12 sevenths. So 11 sevenths. At minus three quarters plus 11 twelfths multiplied by nine sevenths is three sevenths. And then finally, 45 quarters plus 11 twelfths times 63. 69. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, good. That ends part D and finally part E. Uh, using, as I explained, using T, whether or not an optimal solution to the original learning programming problem has been found. So E part I, yes, it has been found. And this is because uh, the bottom row contains no negatives. Uh, part two, write down the value of the objective function. Okay, so P max is 69. This is the value on the right. And then part three says, state the values of the basic variables. Um, so because it says explicitly the basic variables, you have to just do the basic variables. If you actually left anything more than that, you actually lost the mark. Um, so the basic variables are x, which is 24, z, uh, which is 7, s2, which is 63. That's okay, that's the decision paper. Um, I was a little bit friendly with the grammar between the two booklets, but uh, hopefully you're happy with, with those answers. And again, if I teach you, feel free to come and ask me for any questions. If I don't teach you, drop a message in the comments and I'll get back to you. Thank you for watching.